welcome to the International Institute for Strategic Studies. For those who don't know me, my name is Dana Allen. I'm a senior fellow here and editor of, our, of the IISS journal Survival. Um, you know, there's a case to be made that uh, climate change and associated energy futures constitute one of the two or three most serious strategic challenges facing humanity. Um, and there's plenty of evidence that it's not just a potential um, and potentially catastrophic issue for the future, but precisely a current threat multiplier in places like Syria, where a long period of drought has arguably um, con contributed to the stresses that have erupted in, in the ongoing civil war. Um, and uh, you know, as I say, the, um, the the associated question about energy futures is is, is also some, one of the most uh, how to put it portentous strategic questions uh, facing us. The CNA in Washington, which, by the way, in a somewhat theological di distinction, is not the Center for Naval Analyses, <laughs> although it <coughs> grew out of it. There is a relationship between those letters. We, and, we and try the, to start out by confusing yeah, yes. everyone. Um, <laughs> and it generally works. It, it, it's like a trinity, apparently. There is, <laughs> there is, it, it houses the Center for Naval Analyses and, and grew out of it. But um, it has a group of analysts, including retired military officers, who are studying these issues um, and have come out with two reports, um, recent reports, I think, um, that are um, examples of which we have in the back. One is the role of water stress and in instability and in conflict. The other is advanced energy and U.S. national security. In any event, four of them, um, we're delighted to say, are here today. And because there are four of them, I'm going to proceed briskly. Um, but let me introduce them very quickly, um, starting with, uh, I believe, uh, the first speaker is Vice Admiral, retired Lee Gunn, who spent 35 years in the U.S. Navy, uh, including as Inspector General for the Department of Navy. Uh, our second speaker is, uh, sorry, I have a slightly complicated set of um, bios, is General Don Hoffman. General Hoffman was 38 years in the United States Air Force, and his last active duty assignment was as a commander for the Air Force Material Command. He will be followed by Julia, back to my original list, Julia McQuaid, who's an expert for CNA on international security issues, including terrorism, counterterrorism, um, and water stress as a driver of conflict and insecurity. And then finally, um, retired from the Royal Navy, Rear Admiral Neil Morissetti, uh, whose last active duty appointment was on the UK's climate and energy, as the UK's climate and energy security Envoy engaging with policymakers around the world to discuss, address the security implications of these issues. Um, with that very brief introduction um, and trying to refer back to my list, we're going to have some brief opening um, comments from all four of our panelists and then have a discussion. Um, Vice Admiral Gunn. So we don't get to hear from Sherry. All right. Um, <laughs> Let me say something about the Military Advisory Board at CNA. Um, in 2006 and 2007, a group of retired um, admirals and generals representing all the services, mostly three and four stars, got together to work with the research staff at uh, CNA Corporation to examine the question of whether there were uh, national security implications of climate change that, to that point, uh, had not been considered and produced a report uh, which said specifically that the changes that the world was, was undergoing and those that were anticipated in the future were going to have national security consequences, that those were already being felt and that they needed to be accounted for in the planning of the Department of Defense. Um, we talk in the Military Advisory Board to, of course, the U.S. national audience. We talk to the U.S. government, but we talk specifically and in a focused way to the U.S. Department of Defense. And in each of our reports, we have made recommendations to those who followed us in leadership positions in the DOD 
about the steps they should take to um, take into account the things that we've discovered. And we've, we've written a total now of 10 reports, and they've dealt with first um, energy, uh, a set of energy reports that followed that initial report on climate change and national security, dealing with the individual issues of energy that we thought were the most important and the most troublesome, given the changes that the environment was going to go through. Um, we updated the report on climate change in 2014, starting in 2013, because the group saw at that point that there were, there was, that the, the rate of change of the things that were going to affect the, both the military capabilities and the demand on the U.S. Department of Defense, the rate of change was greater than we thought it was going to be. The science was better, the data was more, con more conclusive and more convincing, and the on-the-ground and on-the-seas effects that were being felt of the changing climate uh, were already more profound than we'd anticipated seven years before. Uh, since then, we've talked about the resilience of the U.S. National Electric Grid, um, we've said that that's a serious problem. Most recently, we've talked about advanced energy in all its forms, and we're going to touch on some of that today in important ways, because advanced energy uh, is, we believe, an imperative. Adoption of advanced energy means of production is an imperative um, for many reasons, uh, not the least among them that there's an economic competitiveness aspect to the strength of the U.S., um, of the of U.S. as a nation that needs to capitalize on the opportunities and not just the threats associated with the need for new energy. And then we're rolling out today and tomorrow the, the water report. Julia McQuaid was uh, the leader of the team that did the water report, and so she'll be talking more about that. Um, we live in tough times, and that's not news to anybody here. But we've compartmented these tough times into four categories for the purposes of discussion today. Traditional national security threats. Now in the United States, the Defense Department has a, a way of categorizing them that's called four plus one. Um, four are challenges of one degree or another from existing states. That's, that's Iran, uh, North Korea, uh, China, and Russia in no particular order. The plus one is the non-state threat worldwide, the metastasizing, I would say, threat of terrorism um, that you in the UK ha have to contend with on even more of a daily basis, I think, than those of us in the US. But it's going to affect all the Western countries to one degree or another, whether it has already. So that's the traditional piece. Um, the growing uh, radical extremist metastasizing piece is the second one that I just mentioned. New threats in the form of cyber. Um, we don't know yet what the extent of this is going to be and I'm afraid that we're going to find out as it's unveiled to us by virtue of its effects. Um, obviously attacks on electronic control systems are going to be a, a very important feature and may play a profound role in the ability of both the United Kingdom and the United States uh, to react around the world in the way we need to to other threats. Um, and then there's a new one. We'll spend most of our time talking about that. And this is resource struggles. These are, um, this is the increasing competition for resources uh, of this planet uh, that accompanies uh, growing uh, population, increasing striving for the middle class, uh, among that growing population and the like. So uh, we'd like to talk about water, food, and energy and the nexus of those items. Um, in addition, the world is increasingly interconnected um, in supplies and in manufacturing and dependent and mutually dependent on one or another for labor and the processes of production. Uh, three major drivers of our evolving security challenges. The first is population. Uh, the population in the next 30 years or so in Africa will double from 1 to 2 billion, 400 million additional people projected soon in uh, South Asia. It may be that India already surpasses China in terms of 
of population. Um, energy, there's a demand for energy is going to increase as a result of absolute numbers of people, but also of their striving, their anticipated uh, entrance into uh, a worldwide middle class. Uh, and the other effect that's, that we see before our very eyes is the changing means of production, new alternative ways of producing energy um, to satisfy that demand. And then the last is climate change. Now, when we talk in the United States to audiences, often skeptical audiences, about, about climate change, people will say, well, the climate has always changed. The Earth has changed before. And the answer is, of course, it has. We've had 12,000 relatively quiet years. Um, a, a blink of an eye geologically, but it's been important for the development of the human race. And the climate has never changed before in the history of the world with the, with the need to support 7 to 10 billion people. And that's what we face now. Um, the National Intelligence Council in the United States produced the Global Trend 2030 report. Uh, it says uh, that um, energy will increase in the next uh, two decades. The demand for energy will increase by 50%. Uh, fresh water demand will go up by 40% and demand for food by 35%. Those are all challenges that are made more difficult to meet by climate change. Um, Time magazine uh, wrote an article entitled, just most recently, The Sixth Great Extinction is Underway and We Are to Blame. So for people who don't understand the profound effects on the millions of species that are still resident in our world, they need to take that into account and what the loss is going to cost us. Um, you know, through all this, the question might be, why are representatives of the U.S. here, and why is Neil Morissetti uh, a member, and has he been a member for some time of the Military Advisory Board at CNA? I'll tell you, from a U.S. point of view, it's because we need Britain to be with us. We need your international leadership in addressing the, the challenges associated with climate change, energy, water, and eventually food scarcity. We need the, the British military. We need your diplomatic corps. We need to go at these changes together, as we have uh, for the last many decades. Um, we need your help and we need your company uh, in this. Um, it's increasingly clear that water, food, and energy are inextricably linked, just a couple of items. Um, water is, of course, important for agriculture, for energy production, that is cooling in particular for fossil fuel uh, combustion production of energy. Uh, uh, the, Crops are being used for biofuels. Energy is being used to desalinate water. Most of the water used in Israel is desalinated. Um, you know, the, uh, the food nexus is terribly important. We're not, not going to talk about much of that today, but if the world continues to depend on the U.S. to be the breadbasket, uh, we need to worry about conditions in the United States, too. And so just to let you know how profoundly the U.S. is affected, uh, underneath the center of the United States is an aquifer called the Ogallala, Ogallala Aquifer. Um, it feeds most of the breadbasket, the wells that are producing the water to produce the crops in the middle of the United States uh, the, are drilled into the Ogallala. Uh, its surface is reducing at a rate of six feet a year. Uh, it will not be inexhaustible. The Mississippi River takes from 92 million tons to um, to 690 tons of topsoil uh, a year into the Gulf of Mexico. So the U.S. has its own uh, issues with that. All right, uh, without alternatives, the growing energy demand will be met by fossil fuels, empowering the nations that presently produce that. Not Great Britain and Norway, that's not what we're worried about. We're worried about Russia and Iran and Venezuela. Um, they will meet most of this energy demand. So we're advocating instead moving to advanced energy in a profound, important, and rapid way. Um, 
It's about jobs and prosperity in the United States. We believe it probably is about jobs and prosperity for advanced energy in the UK as well. Um, just one, a uh, couple of uh, concluding remarks. Uh, Admiral Sam Locklear, Lock, Locklear, when he was the commander of the U.S. Pacific Command, and asked about the existential threat to the United States, said that climate change was the existential threat to the United States. So the military is not <coughs> fooling around with this. And the economic aspects of employing and, and advancing energy um, in new technological means is emphasized by Admiral Mike Mullen, who was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who said that the economic pillar was at least as important as the diplomatic and military pillar of American strength. So with that, let me turn it over to General Don Hoffman. Right. Thanks, Lee. Uh, glad to be back here uh, in England. Uh, I was uh, living here, uh, stationed here, 17, 18 years ago, and uh, at that time, most of us, I think, let me refresh your memories, we were dealing with another potential man-made crisis, global crisis at the time. Remember what that was? Y2K. Real or contrived? Does this sound familiar? Okay. But we put, and after it was over, it was like, big, you know, done drinking, you know? <laughs> the lights are still on, phone still works, you had to read the paper the next morning to find out what happened, and there were some disconnects. Uh, and some would say it was, it was another hoax, okay? Uh, but I would submit that, you know, a lot of people and a lot of collaboration across lines that never got collaborated across before around the globe erased that crisis, okay? And it, and it was not a big deal. Uh, but it could have been, I think the, the jury's still out about how significant it might have been, but just as an example of what collaboration and cooperation can do to address a crisis of our own uh, making there. So, small example there, uh, I just, it's kind of need to be back in England on the anniversary of that, that event. Um, uh, glad to be here, as I said. Uh, let me talk about the energy and advanced energies and so forth, but first, historically, I just want to say that energy has always been a part of military operations, okay? And the more and more we got into movement of military forces, the more significant the energy uh, part came. So whether it's fodder for Napoleon's horses, coal for the Royal Navy, or for the last century now, uh, liquid fuel, the movement of all our surface vessels and air vessels, uh, it's a key uh, to the modern battlefield. And I would say when you're in the fight, you won't find a tank commander, you won't find an aircraft commander, you won't find a, a ship captain that's not constantly thinking about how much energy do I have, how much fuel do I have to stay in the fight, survive in the fight, get my mission done, and where do I refuel, how far away is it in time or hours before I can get more? Because if that's, that's right in the back of their mind, other than looking at the enemy in front of them, it's how long can I stay here and do this? And the possible exception might be the nuclear navy. Okay, so that's kind of been taken off the table, you know, for those ships and submarines that have not unlimited, but certainly longer, that's not the limiting factor for the duration of engagement. Uh, so that's very important, but as military members on the MAB, that was of interest, but more significant for us on the geopolitical discussion and the national security discussion is, what's the role of energy in getting us to this fight in the first place? Why are we fighting, okay? And is energy one of the uh, sources of, of conflict that does it? And for over a century, we've had this dependence on liquid fuel that has created tension between those that have it and those that need it. Uh, and it's, it's spawned many unsavory relationships uh, with countries and people that don't always share our values, uh, our way of life. But it was a necessity to do it. So resulting in shortages and, uh, and, and spikes in price and all that have uh, perturbated a lot of the economics of, of the global situation and so forth to again drive impacts that affect national security for all those that are involved. So we felt that we now have a window of opportunity uh, driven primarily by one of the advanced energies, uh, advanced uh, non-traditional extraction uh, that give us some breathing room for the existing fuel sources to harvest it in a different way. Uh, to maybe be ready for the future when those start drying up, okay? And the reserves in fossil fuels are continually discovered, uh, but they're not infinite. Okay? At some point, we're gonna have to switch over. So there's, there's elements uh, to that. 
So in this, this window of opportunity, we think, is a, is a good time for nations, uh, and certainly the U.S., and I would submit the U.K., to look at where, what's your future energy posture out there, and how do we use this window uh, to our advantage. Uh, and we think advanced energy uh, is important in that transition. Let me just read from the report, which there's comments in the back, what we had as a working definition of advanced energy. It's the suite of technologies and systems that can lead to more globally accessible, clean, and safe energy supply. These technologies include sources, such as nuclear, hydro, renewables, or alternative power, and the associated technologies and systems that distribute, store, and manage energy. They also comprise uh, the systems that make existing energy more efficient. Just as the 20th century was dominated by energy production derived from oil, coal, and natural gas, we expect this century, the 21st century, to have both greater energy efficiency from traditional sources and a greater array of new sources. So in our working definition, it's not fossil fuel versus everything else. It's, it's the tail end, probably, of fossil fuel to use more effectively where you need the high energy density, like flying airplanes, uh, and it's really the only answer, practical answer. Uh, and it's the incorporation for other things like uh, powering the grid, powering electric vehicles and all that, that we can really bring in these uh, advanced energies. Uh, and there'll be more and more technologies we don't even understand now what they are and what the potential is going to be. Uh, in the U.S., the Department of, Events, uh, Department of Defense is embracing all of these. So if you look at any of the services, you look at our base structure, especially our garrison basing at home, you'll see wind and solar, because uh, we've got a lot of real estate on some of these bases. Uh, so sometimes we're just the real estate owner for a huge solar farm or a wind farm. In other cases, we're buying it from neighborhood uh, opportunities. Uh, but we're embracing renewables. Uh, we have qualified almost all our equipment to operate on different fuels, whether it's a synthetic blend that makes liquid fuel, or whether it's a bio-based uh, blends, they all come with uh, issues on pumps and seals and performance of the engines and so forth. So we've qualified all the equipment with a mixed blend to operate on that. Uh, we've also looked at what battle gear do we take to the fight and how can we make that more efficient? How can we increase storage, especially for the man carry stuff? So that special operators and they're carrying enough weight as it is, but how do they get through more than one day's, you know, your cell phone runs out in about a day. How do they get through a week in the field? How many batteries do you got to carry? So the bottom line is if if it makes us more effective uh, in doing our mission, we're, we're on board in the DOD and we're chasing a lot of those, those things. For our major weapon systems, we have a requirement that we have to consider energy use as one of the key performance uh, parameters of how we make a decision on which weapon system to buy. Now we don't have a lot of options there for airplanes, for example. Uh, you know, we do have a new jet engine that we've developed. Okay, it's got a high bypass uh, cycle on it that once you get airborne in a way with your heavy fuel and, and bomb load and all that, you can go into a very efficient cruise mode that greatly extends. But it's not operational on any aircraft yet. It's, you know, we tested it in the laboratory. It had to be sized for a particular platform Maybe the Joint Strike Fighter in a midlife engine upgrade or something like that, or new airplanes that come out. But the fleet we got, whether it's airplanes, ground vehicles, surface vehicles, submarines, the fleet we got is the fleet we got, and we're going to continue to operate. So we can't do a lot about our movement energy for a while. But as we buy new weapon systems, it's, it's certainly uh, something that we uh, are very uh, concerned about. So. Just to pose the question of what do we do, how do we help make this transition? From a national government standpoint, I would submit uh, we can first of all lead by example. Uh, and some of us are doing a better job of that than others. You know, leading by example. Uh, setting enduring policies that go beyond more than one political cycle would be very helpful for industry and everyone else to mobilize around and say, okay, this is the vector that we're on, this our national strategic plan for energy. <coughs> And industry can make investments, uh, and we can make other decisions there, not about the next two years or four years, but a decade or two decades out. Uh, that would be very useful for any national government to do. <clears throat> I think national governments can also accelerate a lot of the uh, research and development. Uh, they have more horsepower behind them than individual uh, laboratories or universities and so forth. So they can accelerate promising technologies and get them field it sooner. Uh, and then for the rest of us, the local governments, industry, individuals, what can they do? 
first of all, don't wait for what I just said about the national government. Okay, move out on your own. Okay, there are things within your control that you can do, whether you're industry or you know local governments and so forth. I, as an individual, and my example is not universal for eight billion people, uh, but I'm essentially net zero. Where I live. I built my retirement home with all this in mind. Uh, I have no propane, no fuel oil, nothing like that. Basically all electric, but I'm net zero. I have passive solar, I have photovoltaic, I have geothermal, and I, my primary heat source is biomass, burning wood. So I don't say that's the way the world ought to go, but I'm just saying, if we think that way, you're just more in tune. So whether it's bottom up or top down, I think we need to work this whole problem together and find you know, what the path forward is. And it's not one path. It's every house, every city, every country's got slightly different paths because they have different resources and they have different demands. So to close, and I'd be glad to take questions and stuff later, but uh, I'd say that for over a century, oil has been the engine of prosperity. Uh, and it's allowed us to grow, you know, the crops we can grow from energy and so forth. It's allowed us to get seven billion plus and we're still growing. So it's been the engine of prosperity, but, but, it has also been the global enabler of corruption, coercion, conflict, and environmental contamination. So I'd say advanced energy has the potential to mitigate these four Cs. It won't eliminate them all, but it will certainly mitigate them. So from my perspective, I see the ultimate goal as the democratization of energy. So that we take technologies, we take our future plans and all that, we share it with our friends, we share it with our adversaries. So that Nobody's holding someone else hostage, but I got the energy and you all need to you know, go my way. Everybody's holding a part of the stick of the energy solution, okay? Rich nations, poor nations, all nations. So we take energy off the table as a source of conflict and friction. Okay, it's like the oxygen we breathe. Okay, it's there for everybody. And that's potential because the sun shines on us every day with much more energy than we could possibly use. That creates wind for wind energy. <coughs> In millennia past, it created the energy that we're pulling out of the ground. So it all comes from the sun at some point. So there's, there's a trail here for our advanced energy <coughs> that is indeed infinite if we choose to go down that path. So with that, uh, we'll switch to water with Julia, and we'll talk about water for a while. Wonderful. Thank you. So thanks, everyone, for coming today. I'm very eager to roll out this report today, which I've had the pleasure of working with the MAB on for the past year or so. Um, I just... I'm a conflict researcher. I look at insurgencies, counterterrorism, and this is really my first foray into the energy, water, food nexus. Um, but I've been intrigued with the topic for a long time because I like to think about and study drivers of conflict, and particularly at the US, uh, US military, who I support a lot on the counterterrorism front, trying to expand thinking about drivers of this type of conflict, drivers of insurgencies, in ways that allow us to access perhaps more effective ways of coming at that problem set. Um, so what I'd like to do is just spend about six to eight minutes going through some of our findings. And I'm going to adhere pretty closely to my notes on that um, to make sure that I get through all the major points. And then what I'm hoping is that in the Q&A session, you know, I can take questions and dive in a little more specifically uh, on specific examples uh, of our work. Um, but the starting point for, for kind of my spiel here is that first of all, and, and we lay this out in great detail in the report, is that many parts of the world today are experiencing water stress. And if we continue on a kind of the path that we're on, it's projected that uh, water stress in many parts of the world, world where it already exists will get worse and that it will expand and emerge in places uh, where it does not exist today. And so the arc of this problem is that it will get worse, not better, unless uh, things change, okay? So with that in mind, um, as water stress becomes increasingly scarce and populations grow, as we've already talked about, we will put more stress on the water that we have. And it will become increasingly important to understand how water stress contributes to things like violence, conflict, and state instability or for state fragility. Why? I mean, to me, the answer seems pretty obvious, but I'll just say straight up that this can help decision makers and planners and people responsible for resources make better well-informed decisions about how to prevent and dampen conflict in a way that for the U.S. boards our national security, but also helps protect partners and allies and friends around the world. So in order to gain the understanding of the link between water stress, instability, and conflict, what we did is we took a look at a numerous recent examples of violence in water stressed areas over the past five years. 
And we looked at, at, at these incidents across a spectrum of different types of conflict, because we know as, as, as in the conflict uh, field that there are many different types of conflict. So we looked at four different types for this work. The first was very low-end civil unrest, so protests, sit-in riots, when people take to the streets. The second is localized violence, so a step up from there, and this would be <coughs> incidents of violence or conflicts among communities, towns, or smaller population, ethnic groups, for example. The third category is a catch-all for terrorism, insurgencies, and civil wars. Of course, these are the types of wars that we're seeing in lots of North Africa and parts of the Middle East as well. And then finally, the fourth category is a good old-fashioned state-on-state conflict, state-on-state war. So the goal is to understand how water stress is or isn't a factor in each of these types of conflict. And before I jump into our findings, I'll just say, as a conflict researcher who focuses a lot on supporting the US Department of Defense and the national security community, um, we really wanted to put this into terms that would translate well to that particular audience. Um, because as much as uh, I would like to say it is the case, and if any of the MAB members disagree, I'm not sure that this is an issue that has a lot of attention or has specifically water stress in that arena. Um, so part of what we were hoping to achieve, of course, was to rise awareness and understanding of how military planners and strategists can think about water stress and get to the so what for thinking about the future of conflict and operating environments. So um, just to hit a few of our main points, what we found is that water stress or the inability to meet the needs of a population has varying roles in conflict, okay? So it does. In nearly all the cases that we looked at, governments or the role of governments uh, and other organizations um, competing uh, for control of populations, and particularly extremist organizations, um, which can, can, can exert control of or otherwise manage water resources was critical. Okay, so governments really, really matter. Um, and it's hard to overstate that. Uh, and we found that common to all of our findings. <laughs> Um, we also found that decreased water availability can be a principal cause of unrest, okay? So there was a direct link there, and we looked at places from South America, across Africa, the Middle East. So in communities, particularly in urban areas, if there are, if there's extended, prolonged, or regular water um, stress, uh, people will take to the streets and put pressure on their governments about it. Um, and, you know, in the vast majority of these cases, governments uh, will respond with some type of band-aid approach. Um, communities will muddle through until uh, the crisis passes. But really what we found was important was that when these types of events occur, if there are pre-existing social or economic tensions in those communities, uh, it can actually uh, escalate um, and become a worse problem. Um, the other factor is also how the government responds. And of course, if security forces are dispatched to respond to, to protests or riots, you know, that can lead to a less stable um, situation. And from the US perspective, in certain parts of the world, in capital cities, for example, that can put US interests directly at, um, at, at threat, you know, either through uh, US uh, citizens abroad or economic interests or supply chains even. So the other thing that we found um, on the more positive side is that water can actually bring nation states to the negotiating table to engage in diplomatic talks across a broad, broad range of issues um, with water stress actually and access, I'm sorry, water access being both a key bargaining chip for those parties um, as well as a principal um, objective of the talks. So, in other words, the idea that shared water resources can bring uh, states together to the negotiating table, and there's a long <laughs> historical pattern of that actually having positive outcomes on the international st uh, stage. Third, we found that actual or perceived changes to current or future shared water resources can add to tensions between upstream and downstream states. Um, so, but the point here is that Historically, um, this has been and remains an unlikely singular cause of states to go to war with each other. Uh, historically, overwhelmingly, people have, states have gone uh, to the negotiating table to work through uh, shared resource issues, um, and it has not been in their interest to resort to military uh, means. However, um, and I can get into the reasons for that, there are any number of them, but however, with increasing water stress, we caution that it probably isn't a good idea to completely dismiss that as a probability 
because simply over time, as water stress gets worse, the stakes become higher. Okay, and you can look at a situation like Pakistan and India to understand that dynamic. So um, the third area that we're, I guess it would be the fourth, um, is really in the, um, in, the ra in the area of violent extremist organizations and terrorist groups, and how do we understand the interplay between water stress and those organizations. And there were kind of two major areas of findings that we have there. So we looked at uh, groups in Yemen, in Libya, in Syria, primarily Boko Haram, Al-Shabaab, and the Islamic State, in Syria and Iraq. Um, and what we found is, first of all, that these organizations have a regular pattern of targeting um, water infrastructure in their operating environments, either to cut off water from a population or to coerce po a population uh, who's uh, following they're looking for. But they also quite, quite adroitly exploit the conditions that water stress creates to their advantage. And this is along the lines of, we've done lots and lots of work in my team and elsewhere, looking at how these types of organizations um, exploit vulnerabilities in their local environment. And water stress and the conditions that it creates can actually contribute to those types of, to those types of vulnerabilities. And so, for example, if you look at a situation like in northeastern Nigeria, where Boko Haram operates, Lake Chad um, has been reduced by 90% since 1963. And you can just even start to begin to wrap your head around the economic outcomes of that situation. You know, fishing villages that can no longer not only uh, make an, an earning off of that, that fishing economy, but also can't feed themselves, um, you know, and suddenly become vulnerable to other types of organizations, among them violent extremist organizations. So we found a pattern of that in different places around the world. Um, and so there's a lot there I think that's interesting. Um, finally, we found that water stress can trigger destabilizing secondary effects. Um, and one that we like to point to in, in, in the report is migration and mass migration, the movement of people. Um, and we know that there are many different reasons that people move, but we found that water stress is one of them. Um, and what we also know is that when people move, they move from one community to another, and sometimes when they move into another community, they are putting stress uh, on pre-existing economic pressures and that this over time can contribute uh, to other secondary and tertiary effects that in some cases can be destabilizing or overpowering to local populations and or uh, turn populations to, um, to other power sources like violent extremist organizations. So um, I have a lot more to say, but I'm going to try to wrap up there because um, I think we can talk a lot of, uh, about it more in the Q&A. Um, but really, the, the big takeaway is that um, with this understanding, we think that governments, including the US and, and the British government, can work with partners to improve water management. Because a lot of this is about water management and not absolute scarcity. So that is the silver lining of this work. Um, and that you know, as we work to uh, reduce water stress through better management, there's a better chance of um, reducing water stress as a factor in conflict and instability. So I will stop there and hand it over to Admiral Morizetti for thoughts on solutions and other reactions. So, that's kind of pressure. Julia, thank you. Um, no pressure. No. Um, as Lee said, I've been working with CNA since about 2009, initially when I was in part of the UK government, and then subsequently since 2014 as a member of the uh, Military Advisory Board. And we've gone around America, we've gone to other countries, and we've done events like this and town hall events. And they speak first, and I miserably just cross off everything I was going to say because they've covered it all. Um, this time I thought I had one up on them, because I'm going to talk about what it means to the UK. But actually, they've done a pretty comprehensive piece of setting the scene of what the challenges are. And in many instances, particularly in the water one, you could delete the S and put a K in the report, and you'd have the problem as we face it. Um, the question, and it's one that everyone's asking, is what are you going to do about it? What do we need to do? Um, we've heard that it's challenging times, conflict or the risks of conflict are much wider than traditionally, we've got non-traditional as well as traditional threats, um, but what, what do you do? Well, you could ignore the non-traditional ones, I mean a lot of them happening a long way away, um, but the reality is if you live in a joined up world, it's going to hit you just as much as it's going to hit the people who are directly impacted. <coughs> For us in the UK, we can see volatility in our prices of raw materials. We can see disruption of our supply chains. 
you'd expect a sailor to say this, but 90% of what comes into this country by volume comes along the supply chains. Lots of potential markets, as we're trying to get all these trade deals with the rest of the world. If they're in unstable countries, no one's going to do trade with them. Um, moving the people. Most of the people stays within the country the people lived in. But we've already seen in the last few years movements from North Africa and elsewhere, the Middle East, into Europe. And there's the issue that instability, shortage of resources, essential requisites for, for, for sustaining life is quite a good recruiting sergeant for violent extremist organisations. There are others who say, yep, yeah, okay, we acknowledge all that, but let's worry about the water nearest the sleigh. Um, and we'll come back to these slow burners later. Well, the reality is that a lot of these pose risks that need to be addressed now before they manifest themselves in five to ten years' time. And anyway, in a number of instances, it's already happening. So, if you're going to do an analysis of the threats to UK prosperity and well-being, it's got to be comprehensive. It's got to be everything we've talked about. The non-traditional threats, as well as resurgent Russia, cyber terrorism and other issues. And we have to understand the interdependencies between those threats to understand what the problem is. Now, it's a bigger job, but it's not rocket science. Much of the tool, many of the tools you would use for the analysis of traditional threats, you can use for non-traditional threats. You do have to vary some. Indicators and warnings are a good example. Um, during the Cold War, we were really good at what the Third Shock Army was doing, or the Baltic Fleet, the new commander, the new doctrine, the new kit. Well, perhaps with some of these, we've got to look at weather forecasts. We've got to look at um, what's happening to the price of wheat, what's happening to the price of rice, and those sort of things to understand the interdependencies. Um, and we're going to draw from many more sources than we have traditionally done so. But only when you do all that do you get a proper national security strategy, I would argue. Um, and perhaps that's a question we should be looking at with the re current review that's going on of the uh, 2015 National Security Strategy and Defence Review. When you've got a comprehensive picture, you can start to determine priorities and what sort of actions required. And that's probably when it gets a bit challenging. Because we've talked about a lot of issues which are risks to national security. But there is no security solution to these issues. There is greater insecurity if you don't act. And yes, the security community have a part to play. They can do the analysis. Um, they, in the context of adaptation and mitigation, where appropriate, they can act. Um, they can help build capacity and resilience in, in fragile states where these issues are at, at, uh, at their greatest, as one of a number of actors. But if we really want to reduce the risk to a manageable level, then it's a whole of government, it's a whole of society, and it's a public-private partnership exercise. Um, if you look at our international development strategy, Julia's talked about water and, and management. We need to make sure we get that right. I met with a Pakistani water minister a few years ago, and I will quote almost verbatim. I walked into his office and he said, if you're going to tell me you'll offer me another effing well, you can get out. If you give me two places at Edinburgh University to do water management, then we can have a really good discussion. They got their two places. But we have to think a bit different from we have in the past. Yes, we need energy in, in, in developing economies in order that they can boost their economies so they have growth and prosperity, but we don't need a coal-fired power station. There's lots of other technologies, many of which have come from what the military have used on expeditionary operations. Energy strategy. The report talks about the need for America to have an energy strategy. We need an energy strategy. Big business needs an energy strategy. The military has to have energy strategies. Five, you know, supply and demand, energy efficiency, work through the natures of power, research and development, get the grid right, get the technology right for storage, etc., Whilst we're still using fossil fuels, worry about where they're coming from, the stability in those regions, and the supply chains, as you move forward, though, into, in, into a more renewable-based one. <laughs> and research and development is critical, and which means we need to draw on academia, we need to draw on industry, and many others to make sure that we're looking at all the options and sharing that information around between countries, as, as Don has talked about. <coughs> all of which has to be brought together with a narrative a story that explains why we're doing it, why we're changing the way we're doing our business. And that is critical. And we have to have the right storytellers to tell that story to an audience who has an affinity with that storyteller. Now, these people have only been in the UK a couple of days, but they've had a chance to read the papers and life is dominated by a few other issues at the moment. So this requires some leadership. 
It requires people to drive around with their headlights on full beam rather than dicked worrying about the next negotiations in Brussels or whatever. Because these things will be with us wherever we are, whether we're in Europe, without Europe, or whatever community we're in. And we need to address them now if we're going to reduce the risks and increase our, <coughs> the risk, the, uh, our prosperity and well-being. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks, thanks to all of you. Uh, that's a rich... Um, a rich menu of discussion around these issues. Uh, we have actually only about 15 minutes for discussion, so, um, and I already see a couple of people who've asked for the floor, but let me start with, with a question that will not um, hopefully bring things to a screeching halt, but um, uh, uh, Admiral Morissetti, you said you, you mentioned the need to have leadership and a, a, a compelling narrative about about these problems. Um, General Hoffman, uh, you said at one point that we have to somehow have policies that go beyond a given political cycle. Um, I mean, the first thing that is obviously going to be in a lot of people's minds when you say this is that. Um, all but one of you guys come from the United States, and um, we did have the, we did have I, I don't know how you know hopeful they were or how effective they were, but the United States was committed to trying to deal with the larger issues through the claim through the Paris process, um, and then we had an election, and we have. Um, a president who has called climate change a hoax foisted on us by China, um, and frankly, an entire political party in the United States that has insisted that this is not an issue. So I, I guess what I'm driving at, I know that the Pentagon, from whence um, uh, half of you come uh, originally, had has long looked at this as a very serious security issue and, and, and a sort of very pretentious one. But I, I, you know, I, I guess the question on a lot of people's mind is how do, you, um, how do you put forward these kind of sober and serious um, alarms in the face of the political situation in the United States? Yes. I would, uh, let me first offer a phrase that's been attributed to Winston Churchill as a quote. But mm -hmm. That's not really true. Uh, mm -hmm. But supposedly, he said, whoever said it says, uh, you, can always trust, you can always tell Americans to do the right thing, but only after we've exhausted all their options. <laughs> uh, and secondly, I'd say, judge us by our actions, not by our words, okay, or our tweets. Okay. So uh, if you look at the U.S., there's a whole grassroots level there of, of things going on. There's the Council of Mayors. I don't know how many signatures Lee was on that document. said, my city is going this way. California has said this state is going this way. So that's my point about don't wait for the federal government to do this before you all move up. So judge us by our actions, I would say, over time, uh, not by volatile uh, political cycles. I think that's really good advice. Uh, I'm a Californian. Uh, I'm becoming a card-carrying member of the California <laughs> separatist movement. Uh, we, are, we are the seventh largest economy in the world, and we're leaving. Uh, no, uh, that's obviously just kidding. Um, but the fact is, <laughs> particularly, as, particularly as a quote, it's kidding. Um, the, uh, the, the fact is, as uh, General Hoffman says, we travel uh, as part of the Military Advisory Board. I've spent a lot of time in states, mostly red states, uh, talking to audiences uh, receptive and skeptical about this. But the fact is that there is great energy, human energy, uh, throughout the United States devoted to continuing to achieve the goals of Paris, our obligation to meet the goals of Paris. And what uh, General Hoffman was referring to is there is a U.S. Conference of Mayors. It's 1,026 cities. Um, they all, or virtually all, signed a letter both to the, Mr. Trump and to the Paris uh, conveners saying, we're, we're still in. Uh, there are all sorts of self-organizing uh, groups in the United States. There's a, there's a national caucus of, le of environmental legislators, for goodness sakes, Republicans and Democrats from state legislatures across the country who, who have gotten together, regardless of their other, uh, the other parts of their political philosophies, to, to say we're still in. Uh, states are doing things, regional consortia are doing things, 
Um, actually, even utility operators in the United States are recognizing the economic advantages of moving to advanced energy um, and the importance of saving the water associated with uh, eliminating combustion uh, energy production. So I just want to tell you, I think the momentum is there. I tell audiences that um, we'd love to have federal leadership in this, but for the moment we're doing without it and we're going to do without it just fine. I think that means it's all the more important that we feed this momentum at the local level and that's what the Military Advisory Board and, and in addition to other things is trying to do. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, just if I can add to that because I used to go around America with this long list of lines to take from the UK government or from Europe about everything about being green and, and low carbon, clean tech. And they look at me and say, yeah, we did that years ago. Don't underestimate. I think you slightly underplayed what is going on in America at the, at the state local level for economic reasons, for health reasons, for job reasons, for wallet, for whatever. Now we've got to share that impetus, and perhaps we need to do a bit of reinvigorating in this country as well to, to try and catch up with some of those American states. Antonio, please, so, please identify yourself. Sure. Okay, since I guess. Antonio Sampaio from the IISS. I work at the Security and Development Program here, so these issues are very dear to, to us. I'm trying to um, understand the so what of this beyond the military uh, and defense um, environments. So um, a big part of our work here, and it's, it's quite a challenge um, to raise awareness broadly about the need to have in mind the development, socioeconomic development tools of policy making, international intervention, stabilization, the work that you know the World Bank and the United Nations do um, on the socioeconomic development of fragile states with the security and military problems. Um, so obviously it's important to raise awareness for the uh, defense and military trials that these issues are connected, that the water stresses can cause conflict and therefore we need to be prepared. But um, how do you connect the, um, a national security view of the conflict multipliers with the work that you know others like the World Bank, the United Nations are already doing all these things. So uh, I, I, I think that as you go around um, presenting a work, I think it's very important um, to raise awareness of this need to, to have in mind the development side of things as well, which I, I haven't heard so, so often in, in the presentation. So just to have this connection between the two types of work. Can okay, I, can, I, so can I actually suggest that we gather some questions, okay. and because um, there are four of you, so uh, yes, right, right there. Chris Bradley, I'm a professor of climate science at University College London. I spend a lot of my time communicating climate science to business people and to the general public, uh, but I also chair an organization called the London Climate Change Partnership, which brings together um, the public sector, private sector, and civil society in London in an adaptation program to ensure that London is a, a resilient capital city against climate change. And the point I wanted to make was to pick up exactly on the question that you've raised and some of the comments that are being made. In a, in a heavily globalized world, um, many uh, uh, companies, uh, even quite small ones, are interested in risk management, managing their supply chains. They feel extreme weather events very uh, significantly already. They persuade their boards that they should do projects to uh, try and ensure that they're um, more robust against weather extremes and water stresses, all the things we've been hearing about. And, uh, and the same is true in, in, in London, the London Climate Change Partnership. And time after time, um, the projects look at um, their uh, vulnerability at present. They figure out where they can improve their resilience. And then they start to look forward into the future, and they see the costs and the damages increasing exponentially. And at that point, they say, it would really be a lot better not to go here. So actually, what starts out as an adaptation exercise turns into a mitigation exercise. So that's a useful portal. You see it happen time and time again. It's a useful entry point for any company that has a supply chain always going to be impacted in this way. So just maybe it's helpful to think. Just a comment, then. Yes. Hi, I'm um, Prince Shao from Chinese Embassy. Uh, I just got a question about the energy. Now that uh, the United States is also developing the shale gas, uh, and uh, uh, many people say that this will uh, increase the uh, ability of the United States to not rely on the 
children from the Middle East or elsewhere. And I don't know how do you look at the future uh, for these kind of the scenarios. And um, there was one more back here. Was this? Can we? <laughs> yes, go ahead. Uh, can I? Yeah. Yes, fair. Uh, Dr. Christian and I took the World Peace Organization. Uh, concerning energy, I'm a scientist and diplomat. I think in science has infinity. We'll always find some resources. It's not a problem. But what concerns me, recently I was in New York, in the United Nations. It's a whole world with a watch, uh, electronic. How many billions? was spent for wars, for killing. And it's written, war is overarmed, peace is underfound. So what we need, first of all, it's a global problem and priority problem to create new competitive international organization, such which can give a peace guarantee for entire world. And my research and my proposal says that the best instrument for this kind of purpose are military. So why don't we create an international organization of military leaders to prevent conflict, to prevent war, not killing each other? So that means to jump to high level of self organization of humanity, high level of civilization and culture. That's my... Well, we have a small organization that's here what, that's devoted that's to uh, at least, at least to making proposals so, and uh, no, uh, of military but people. It's very important to go this way. Otherwise, okay. we'll kill each other. Okay, I can take one last question or comment, and then we'll go back to the panel. Yes, sir. Thank you. Andreas, thank you for reading. Um, the debate we're having here is not very new. Um, it's interesting to see that the military is picking up on it. It's also interesting to see that the traders and the crystal are taking up gun control in the U.S., so the military gets vocal and all sorts of things. Quick question, what is the added value that the military now deals with it? You cannot send, send out tanks or carriers or anything like this to solve that problem. Most of the stuff it was about adaptation to uh, the, the problems, but is there anything the military can add to solving this problem? Okay, well those are, um, some, some of those were comments and some of them were questions, but I'll just maybe go back and shall we go in reverse order um, and invite you to respond to anything you want to um, or nothing at all. <laughs> I'll start with you. Um, geopolitical stability, which I was talking about, is not an end state. It's a prerequisite for sustained economic growth and prosperity, without which you can't alleviate poverty and without which you can't in the process reduce some of the instability around the world. Uh, Admiral Gunn talked about uh, Mike Mullen, talking about the importance of economic growth. Uh, the, back in 2012, the then Chief of Defence Staff here in the UK, David Richard, was asked, what's the greatest threat to the UK national <coughs> security? He said, a failure of the economy to recover. You need that. So we have got to work to build, to reduce that instability, whether through our development programs, through international aid, in building capacity resilience in that arc where the countries are most affected, or whether it's in ensuring that the developed world economies continue to grow, because without the two, you, 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 you have a problem. Conflict prevention is in both the Quadrennial Defence Review and the UK National Security Strategy, and this Capacity and resilience building is part of that conflict prevention. You still need to retain the ability uh, to resolve conflict, but the military around the world are, ref are reflecting that need for conflict prevention. And what do we add? Probably the principal thing is we can do analysis of threats. And we should be prepared to do the analysis of those threats as a security community in the round, not just defence, and make sure that truth is spoken unto power as to what the threats to our respective national security are. I'd say the uh, same point about the, the military. We're not going to solve the problem. You know, we're primarily in the uh, adaptation world now. So, in the three hurricanes, major hurricanes, you know, in our corner of the world, military is the only one that can get in there initially, uh, and so forth. But the more the more we do that, and we're glad to do that, the less we're doing other things to prepare for a real conflict and all that. So, there's a readiness impact to that. Uh, we're first adapters in a lot of the technology and all that stuff. So, I think, you know. Uh, we benefit the future for all by, by doing that. Uh, but we're not going to make the problem go away. We're big users of energy. If we stop using all the energy, you would have a piece of the solution there on the mitigation side. So. Julia. Well, I mean, I think 
from the way that I look at this, um, I mean, I'm absolutely in agreement with you, and we do get into that in the second part of the paper in terms of the, the solutions and the recommendations, which is this is a whole of government problem set. This is not a DOD problem set to fix. But there is importance in understanding and having the evidence-based research available to DOD leadership from which to draw to make these important points that have already been made about, uh, you know, kind of putting the meat on the bone of this story as a driver of conflict, and when we get into the world of prevention, you know, broadening the scope and scale of different uh, approaches we can take. Um, you know, I think that's, I think that's, that's really, that's kind of from the water trust perspective, that's how I'd address it. But, but I, I see all those questions as being related, actually. Last word. Uh, I, by my analysis, there were uh, five very good questions or comments there. Um, so really quickly, national security in terms of the United States, as I believe it does for Great Britain, relies on uh, four pillars, not one. It's not national security and military strength are not the same. National security in the United States relies on economic strength, diplomatic strength, developmental ability and strength, and military strength. And the reason they're in that order, in my view, is because that's the, that's the, uh, the way they rank in terms of importance. Uh, we should think about the military last. So I think the, the comment that development and diplomacy needs emphasis is just right. And there are a number of us, there's actually an organization of three and four stars in the retired in the U.S. Uh, who are devoting all of our time in that endeavor to argue in favor of development and diplomacy in the federal budget. We're not there to talk about the defense budget. We're talking about the effectiveness that we've seen around the world in all our careers for development and diplomacy. Um, adaptation turns to mitigation. I think that's an important observation. Shale gas relieves the U.S. The, the comment was, may be seen to relieve the U.S. of the urgency to move to advanced energy. That is a very <coughs> legitimate comment. It was something we were worried about. The urgency in moving to advanced energy is because there are strong economic implications of the developmental manufacturing and deployment of, of advanced energy. We don't want that to stop. On the other hand, we do want to take advantage of the fact that, that burning coal is far dirtier than burning natural gas. Um, and so there was a temporary um, low price in the U.S. for natural gas because we were not exporting it. We're now exporting it. Natural gas market in the United States is now exposed to the international market. Price is going up. By my standards, that means we, we, uh, de we decommissioned a lot of coal-fired plants. That was good. But now we're going to have the urgency in coming back economically to move to advanced energy. But that was a very good comment. Uh, international organization military leaders to prevent wars. We'd love to be the nucleus of that. So uh, I, th I think it's a, it's a great idea if we, can, if we can find someone to help us organize that. Uh, and then I, th I think the value of the military paying attention to this uh, is, has already been discussed. So thank you very much for your, uh, your time and attention. Okay, well, thank you. I mean, in, uh, if you'll just pause for just a moment, I just wanted to say that in, the, um, in response to the value added, the military value added question. For whatever, in the American context, it is quite possible that, uh, or at least I've observed, that uh, across the political spectrum, and this is a high, highly contested issue in the American in American politics, um, military voices, uh, whether they speak with extra authority, they're heard with extra authority. <laughs> and um, so I think it's, um, a lot of us are very grateful for, for this perspective and this, um, this strong message. So sorry to interrupt you, but please resume in, in joining me in thanking. <laughs>